I am Kate Kassler, and this is the Veterans History Club at Perry Junior High. Today is February 9th, 2012, and we are interviewing Mr. German. Could you start off by telling us your name? Sure. Ron German Jr. And your branch of service? It was United States Army Reserves. And what was the date that you entered? Uh, it was October 22nd, 1989 is when I signed up, and then I was uh, sent to um, Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas in February of 89. And what was the date that you were discharged? 1996, October. All right. And when, where were you born? I was born in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Little League World Series. <laughs> Not during the World Series. Yeah. <laughs> when were you born? It was, I was born uh, July 2nd, 1965. And what was your education before the service? I actually got my bachelor's degree before I went in, so I was able to uh, be an E3, enlisted man three, just a person cool. three. And why did you join? I already had my uh, degree, so it was always an ambition of mine to, uh, for the service of the country. Uh, my grandfathers were in um, World War II, and my father was in the Army in Germany right before Vietnam uh, War, and it was uh, more like a patriotic duty. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was your basic training? What was it? Yeah. Oh, it was, um, it was eight weeks uh, in El Paso, Texas, very dry. <laughs> Uh, you don't realize how dry it is until uh, your boots start to have white salt deposits all <laughs> over them, and you realize it's a very arid uh, desert type of scene in El Paso. It's very nice, but it was eight weeks of um, Army training, and uh, they, they try and break you down from your civilian kind of life and then build you back up uh, what they would call the Army way, with people yelling at you a lot. <laughs> <clears throat> Did anything interesting happen during your basic training? A lot of it, yes. You know what? The first thing that comes to mind is something that's kind of serious, but it ended up being funny. Um, two people got into a, a fist fight. They, I think, think one person was from New York City and the other person was from Los Angeles, California. And they, they didn't, they had a disagreement and they started to push each other and started to have like a wrestling match, right? And that's a very uh, bad thing to do in the Army because each one of those soldiers are property of the government. Right. So um, they, they take that very serious. So they broke up the fight and as punishment, the whole entire next day, they had to hold hands the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole day uh, as they stood in line to eat their chow, as, they, as we had to do different exercises, they had to hold hands the entire day. And I don't know if they were trying to squeeze each other's hands, but um, that was a very funny thing, you know, to see it. And, and as you can imagine, they became friends. <laughs> and you usually become friends with the person you hold hands with. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you serve? Uh, as far as when I was, uh, after my training was done, yes. I went to, uh, I was in the P Pittsburgh area, but I later moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was south of Milwaukee. So I was um, placed into the 452nd General Hospital. Um, it was a battalion there, and I was um, a, a medic. I was trained as a medic there. What did you, what happened at the hospital? What type of things would happen? Well, what I would do is, um, because I was a reservist, I, I was activated later for a small time in Italy during Desert Storm. Uh, but my monthly uh, weekend drill and my two weeks of uh, annual training uh, I was doing civilian type of work in the emergency room as an ER technologist. I was doing uh, blood pressures, I was doing EKG, there's a 12 lead things that you put on people's bodies to get, get the measurements of the, of the heart rate and uh, so I was doing all the kind of uh, EMT things. I was, I was above an EMT because we were trained to um, uh, start IVs and to draw blood but I was below a paramedic because I wasn't trained in intubation or given medication. So I was like in the middle of an EMT and a paramedic as an army medic. 
What was your rank and title? I went in as an E3 uh, because of my bachelor's degree, actually, and that means um, it's a higher rank, a little more pay, and a little bit uh, more of uh, responsibilities and position. And then um, it was about two years later, I was given the rank of E4, which is a specialist. And because I was in the reserves, I did my six years of active reserve and then two years in active reserve where you really don't do a whole lot unless there's a conflict. Um, and so I ended up being an E4 by the time I was done. What were your <clears throat> daily duties? My, well, um, in basic training, it was obvious you're, you're training so that you, uh, you're just, you're doing everything they say. And then, um, then there was 10 weeks at um, Fort Sam Houston, and uh, there's, it's a really nice area uh, in Texas. That was more like uh, college. You weren't yelled at as much, uh, and they, they would, um, you would do your classroom, then you would do your normal duties afterwards, uh, and then you kind of had free time and things of that nature. Uh, but as far as what they call drill, when I was on the Army clock, so to speak, uh, and especially if, if you want to talk about that later, when I was activated in Vicenza, Italy, northern Italy, that's when I was active duty, and that was all kinds of different hospital duties that I had as a medic. Um, I was part of a, um, in surgery, you have a sterile field where you're, you're supposed to be all washed up and have no germs, and then behind them, because your back is not sterile, so they could never turn around. Uh, so everyone in the sterile field could not turn around. So I was uh, like a circulatory nurse, it's called. I would throw things into the sterile field, uh, like sutures and, and instruments and things for the surgeons and the doctors and the nurses to, to use. I did a lot of that in Italy um, due to the injuries that soldiers would face on the field um, with Claymore mines and uh, they would have certain shrapnel and metal, and, and so they were trying to take them out. And so they would fly them from Saudi Arabia to Italy or Germany uh, before they went back to the United States. So I did a lot of uh, OR kind of stuff, and then uh, as well as um, doing whatever nurses would want you to do. <laughs> uh, but if you were in the field, I was trained, and I, um, of course, you don't want to use your abilities uh, because that would mean someone's really hurt. But I was trained as a combat medic, and that would be to take care of a person that was just injured out in the field and get them out of there uh, safely to, so they go to the hospital. Was there like a list of what you had to do? And yeah. There? Yep. There was a standard operating procedure, SOP. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms uh, in the Army or military, like uh, three letters will say something but stand for something. So um, there was definitely a list that you had. There's a chain of command, which there's someone over you who's someone over them, and, someone, and it keeps going all up to the top. So there were uh, RNs, nurses, that were called uh, 91 Bravos when I was in. I was a 91 Alpha, which is A, 91A as a combat medic. So I had to follow the uh, directions and the orders of people that were over me. So there's definitely a list to do. All right. <clears throat> Did anything unique happen at all when you were at Combat Medic? Well, um, like I said, when I was, um, during Desert Storm when I was in Italy, um, there was some um, very, the, none of the soldiers that we took over their base that were active duty so they could go to Saudi Arabia and we took over Vicenza's army military base in northern Italy and there were some times that um, the, the word is stabilized a lot of times a soldier would be hurt really bad so he'd be stabilized out in the field then sent over to us so the only thing that was really unique that I would remember were certain uh, operations that needed to be done quickly uh, so it was like very serious and you were hoping for the best. But we also had to take care of, um, and that's one thing about a war, um, everybody has a, a role on the team. Uh, it's kind of like a football team uh, or a soccer team. 
um, the, the girl or the boy that's in charge of the player's water is real important. Even though they're not out there, they give them water so everybody tries to get a victory, so everybody gets a, a pat on the back if there's a victory. And so what we did, we had to take care of what's called the dependence of the soldiers. Like if it was a woman soldier, we had to take care of their, her husband and her children. If they had medical problems, they would go to the Vicenza Hospital in Italy. Um, or if the man, if it was a, a, a male soldier and the wife or the children had problems, they would come to the hospital there and we would take care of them because they weren't there. They had to be go to um, Desert Storm, they had to go to Kuwait, you know, or, you know, or Saudi Arabia somewhere for that. <clears throat> what was your commanding officer like? Well, um, Again, there's different levels. In basic training, we only heard of this person by name, so we never met them because we weren't allowed to do anything much. Um, and so I really don't know that, that person. I, they, he had a speech when we first got there. Um, we were getting yelled at all day, so there was a lot of crying <laughs> uh, from, uh, from people. I, I'm glad that I was like uh, 22 because I graduated. I had my bachelor's degree. So I wasn't as scared as like an 18-year-old guy that was crying beside me because they, they, they yell right in your face and they're trying to prepare you like if you're getting shot or fired upon that you could still do your duty even though there's a lot of chaos. You're still able to perform your duty. So they try and uh, make it as miserable as possible. And all I remember from what's called the first sergeant. The first sergeant is the highest ranking enlisted person uh, in the area or on the compound or in the battalion. And that person was very friendly. I wished that person was my trainer because he spoke really nice. <laughs> but the other guys really mean, uh, the, the, the drill sergeant. But everybody was doing their job. Did you have any friends in the service? Absolutely. Um, it was probably, other people probably talked about this, uh, camaraderie, there's like a definite um, uh, joining of uh, friendships in the military. Like I mentioned, the kid from New York City and the kid from Los Angeles, yeah. uh, they became really good friends. Um, there was um, actually a friend of ours that um, went into a, a war situation from our basic training. We went to AIT, which is advanced individual training, after your basic training, to, to train you on what you're going to do in the Army, which in our case were medics. And uh, one of our friends, uh, I didn't get to go to any of his services or anything, but he was actually killed in what's called um, Operation, Operation Just Cause. It was a, a very small, not talked about kind of thing over in Panama. And apparently, from what I heard, he, uh, a soldier was hurt by being shot, and he was giving him an IV. He was giving him fluids in his arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, our friend, uh, his name was Alcola, but we called him Alcohol because, because uh, the drill sergeant couldn't say Alcola, so he just called him Alcohol. Um, and every, most everybody has nicknames in the Army, you know, or military. And, uh, but anyhow, he actually was shot and killed, giving this soldier an IV because he was up too high. And, um, and so that really hurt a lot. And you, you find out who got married, and, and uh, there was a wedding uh, that I stood up for. Like, I was part of the wed a groomsman. Yeah. And, um, you know, and these people, it's kind of like college, who you, you, you develop lifelong friends in college. It's the same with the military. You're pretty much friends forever. <laughs> <clears throat> Going back to nicknames, did you have a nickname? I, the only nickname I had was uh, from Pennsylvania. I rooted for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah. And um, I like to, um, I was, at one time I was actually skinny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um, I, I like to go out and, you know, catch passes and I was fast. And so there was a guy on the Pittsburgh Steelers team, number 88. His name was Swan, Lynn Swan. So they called me Swanee Ron German, so I'm, they called me Swanee. Mm -hmm. um, do you still keep in contact with your friends? There was, uh, no. Um, uh, it, it was in 1996 
when I was actually honorably discharged. And the only, my drill sergeant uh, emailed me once, the one that yelled at me the, the most severely. Um, he was the one that I've kept in contact the most, and it was like uh, three years ago when I contacted, um, his name was uh, Sergeant LaFountain. And um, he, he, was, uh, he was actually an airborne ranger in the Vietnam War. And so, and a lot of my um, teachers to be medics, uh, my medical, you don't call them professors, just instructors they're called. Right. Uh, they were uh, combat veterans in the Vietnam War as medics. So whenever they like said something, it was kind of very, it was real important and very interesting. Whenever they said, this is how you do it when there's a firefight or there's bullets flying all over you, this is what you should do. And you kind of remember that because of what they went through. Do you know if any of them are still alive? Almost all of them are, except for the one that suffered um, the casualty there in the Operation Just Cause. It's kind of a weird question, but what did you eat on base? I don't even remember. No, I'm just kidding. It was, uh, you had to eat in like so many minutes. You didn't even have like 10 or 15. It was like five or four. You couldn't talk. You had to um, rush and eat so fast. Um, there was no sugar. Uh, sometimes I, um, I get headaches and things because I drink coffee, drink a Coca-Cola, and eat cookies and, and sugar and things. But you couldn't have any of that, and it's funny that I didn't have one headache for like eight weeks. I ate so healthy there. Um, and the guys that went in with me that were obese, they, were, they looked like aerobic instructors when they came out. <laughs> Everybody was, looked their best. Uh, and so we ate very well, but we ate very fast. <laughs> I don't know why, but they had things to do. They had, they had, to, they had to have more time to yell at us. <clears throat> Was there anything else interesting about base? Like, were there like your sleeping quarters or like the area itself? Yeah, uh, actually, in basic training, not so much AIT, but. They were called bays, like you lived in a, uh, there was like a, a bed, a bed, a bed, a bed, and you had a little place to put your uniform and stuff. I actually never made my bed. Um, myself and several other people slept on top of their bed because you had um, so many minutes to get up uh, because they're yelling the whole time. You had to get up and do all your things to get ready to go out in formation and stand in line. And everything happened so fast that you, um, you, I didn't have time to make my bed, so I, I made it really good one time, and then slept on top of it, and then I just kind of like pulled it, you know, to make it really straight, because they had to uh, like drop a quarter on it or something and make sure it bounced. Um, so I didn't mess around with that at all. I do remember that. And another thing in our building that we slept, we always, uh, kept the windows open even if it was freezing and I never could figure out why until later that they didn't want the, all of us getting sick right. so they had this constant air going out and we were actually very healthy we didn't have a whole lot of problems even though we were freezing to death you know? <laughs> not really but it was cold you said you went to Italy did you get to see anything, like to see the sights of Italy or anything? Oh, I was so lucky that I did. Um, there was one weekend that we had a chance, it was a weekend pass that you could actually leave <laughs> and not get in trouble. Um, I had a chance to go to Switzerland or Germany, uh, which was north of where we were in uh, northern Italy, Vicenza, or we could go south to Rome. So. I have a very strong Christian heritage, so I, I had to go to Rome. And so we took a L train, a train. Uh, it was eight hours on a train, which I didn't think was possible. But, um, but we got to see uh, uh, signs for places like Bologna, like, like Bologna. Uh, um, there was all kinds of, I actually did go to uh, Venice, which was a little dirtier than I expected. Um, it, it was dumpy kind of like. Really? Yeah. Um, but uh, it was still Venice, you know. Um, but it wasn't really romantic because I just had my friend. So, uh, 
um, <laughs> the, my friend and I, uh, it was just kind of, it was neat to see everybody else, like with their wife or husband or boyfriend or girlfriend, but we just had each other and we didn't want to touch each other. <laughs> but, um, so, but we still got the uh, gondola, we had, uh, we had a little boat ride, you know, with the guy singing. Yeah. You know, was he actually singing? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, my friend dared him to sing. So he started to sing, and I think we gave him $3, some leer. Um, but then we went to the beaches, which were very interesting. Uh, they have a, a swimming suit problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, other than that, uh, we, it, was, it was very interesting to get, get used to. But Rome was um, the Sistine Chapel, St. Peter's Cathedral. Um, amazing things that human beings did that are still there and it was just like um, it, you know, it was it was definitely worth the trip and I'm very glad I uh, got a weekend pass you know to go there um, going back to your like, squat did you have any mascots or like pets or anything um, we did have a mascot. <laughs> it's uh, it sounds really cool. I'm so glad because others were kind of dumb sounding. Yeah. Um, in basic training, I'm not sure how we got it. I don't know if the drill sergeant made it up, the guy that was yelling at us, the instructor. Uh, but we were called the first platoon. Uh, we were called the dogs of war. Cool. And it was a lot better than centipedes or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I st I still have some pictures of um, with our painted mascot with some bulldog called, it, it was so we were called the dogs of war that was kind of masculine yeah. definitely definitely um, while you were serving was there a unique situation you were in hmm. a unique the only thing that uh, scared me sometimes was uh, medically speaking um, there were a couple times where somebody was um, dying and I and uh, they they needed me to do, get a blood pressure really fast and um, I couldn't get one I was doing everything right and the reason was is because his heart beat was so shallow and wasn't beating a whole lot that there was nothing to I, I couldn't get a blood pressure and I got yelled at um, by the uh, doctor the, the physician because he wanted the blood pressure now he wanted to know the reading so he took the blood pressure, and he didn't get one. <laughs> so I was glad about that. Um, but um, the good thing is that per we were able to help this person recover. Um, but it was always, um, because we were combat medics, you never knew, especially in Milwaukee, where I did my reserve weekend, it was called um, St. Mary's in Racine, Wisconsin. And so... It was, I, you never wanted to have somebody. I, I actually became a CPR instructor, which you have to go through a, a, like a course through the Red Cross. And every year you have to be certified. So I was able to certify people to see that they were doing it correctly. Cool. Um, and it, what was really cool is that I had to sign off on the doctors. Uh, they, <laughs> they had to do it in front of me, and I would always tease them and say, I'm sorry, you're doing that incorrectly. Could you move a little to the left? You know, and, and, uh, but they had to listen to me because I had to sign you know, off on that. So, uh, but because I was a CPR instructor and because I was really good at starting IVs, um, they had to pick me to, to do that. So I was always careful you know, to do it right. <clears throat> Did you have a role model? Absolutely. Uh, Sergeant LaFountain, who I mentioned before, was somebody that I uh, really looked up to. He was the drill sergeant. There was three. There was one that was in charge of the whole platoon, the, our first platoon, Dogs of War. He was in charge of everything. And then there was two other guys under him. And um, he never yelled as much because he was in charge. He didn't have to. He made the other guys go crazy on him. So, um, but he, he's the one that chose me... Um, in the um, in the army or military, there's a it's called a platoon. It's your group, and we had four squads. They had like ten, nine or ten guys in each squad, and each squad had a um, I don't know what you call 
squad leader, I think they were called. And I was called the platoon guide. He picked me as a platoon guide during basic training. It's not a real big thing, um, but every, um, every time the drill sergeant would uh, yell out a command, the platoon guide would stand beside the platoon, and he would say the same thing, and then the squad leaders would make them do it. It's kind of like the in-between man, yeah. uh, the go-to guy. Uh, and even though it was still training, uh, and you never get, you never asked to do that, you just get picked. And I think the only reason I got picked is because I was a little older. I was 22 and they were 18. And plus, everything they did for the first three days, I was so scared. Because I grew up in a nice family, I never got yelled at. Like, like that, you know? <laughs> I wasn't used to that, so I was like terrified. So when they said, uh, like, they would call you by your last name, German, get over here. And then I would just like run as fast as I could and say, yes, drill sergeant. You had to say, yes, drill sergeant. And they would say, go to this building and pick out this thing and get over here and you have 30 seconds, go, yes, drill sergeant. So I would run and I would just be so fast and effective, I think that's why I was picked. Um, so um, he, I, I had a chance to, um, uh, for eight weeks, I was like in his office a lot. So I got a chance to know him more than the other uh, soldiers got to know this guy, you know, so I was glad about that. <clears throat> When did you know that you were leaving the service or your area? Uh, as far as when I got activated during Desert Storm yeah. or when I was done with everything? Both. Okay. Um, well, that's very interesting because as a reservist, we would meet um, once a month and go through. I, I was sent to the hospital, but every now and again, we had to go to the 452nd General Hospital main building, you know. Um, and we got a phone call during Desert Storm when it first came out. We were told there's, there's a chance that you could be activated. Like we're actually, and I didn't know if I was going to go to Kuwait. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going to go. And um, it, it's a little bit, it's funny in a way, but it wasn't funny then. If you got a phone call that was from the 452nd General Hospital, this is Sergeant So-and-So. It was almost like... Um, like a detect or a, a spy movie. If if they identified themselves as being from the 452nd General Hospital and they gave their rank, like sergeant and their name, all they were going to say was grazing cattle. If they said grazing cattle, that means we were put on alert that uh, we couldn't. I think it was. I think it was 50 miles or 30 miles, we could not leave our home. Um, if we got a phone call that said raging bull, that means we were going to leave and go to the Chicago, it was, I think it was the Chicago airport because we were close to Milwaukee. Or if it was, I, I don't know if it was Milwaukee or Chicago. I thought it was Chicago we left at O'Hare Airport. If we got a raging bull, then that means within 24 hours we're going to go. So we had to get all our stuff ready. And so I got a couple phone calls of grazing cattle, so you know, it wasn't a real big thing because uh, I had a new baby, um, uh, my oldest son. And um, so it wasn't a big deal until we got the phone call that was raging bull. Like, and then it said, uh, please report to, and we still didn't know where we were going. So we had to pack all our stuff and be there. And we had to have our um, ID, our military ID, our social security number, because you didn't need a passport if you were in the military. And so um, we got to go on a Pan Am, or like a regular civilian, uh, like other people, plus the military. So we took a, uh, it was a, we went to LaGuardia, and then from LaGuardia, it was like an eight hour flight across the ocean. Uh, to uh, Rome, Italy, we flew into. That's when we knew we were going to Italy. I wasn't sure why we were going to Italy if the war's in <laughs> Kuwait. Um, but then we, then we were told we're taking over a base in Italy, so they are going to go to. So you always just waited to hear what you were told to do. So that was very interesting, flying over there. 
one guy forgot his uh, ID, and um, I don't ever know what happened to that person. I, th I think he was um, dis dishonorably discharged or something because of disciplinary problems, because you have to do everything they say, you know. How did it feel leaving your family? That was very sad because um, I think my, my only son at the time, uh, he, I think he was like six months old. So, we had, you know, it was uh, very sad to say goodbye to him. We didn't know how long it was going to be. My wife um, was um, a little sad, but it's not, it, it would have been different if we were going to the deserts of Kuwait and I was going to do my combat medic uh, what I was trained to do and go with a bunch of soldiers to make sure that they're healthy and, and stay alive, that would have been a lot more uh, severe, but it was a little better to know that I was going to Italy. So, you know, but the funny thing is when I, I was about a, not quite a month that I was gone, but when I did come back, um, I was traveling so fast that I was going a little bit above the speed limit and got pulled over by the police. And <laughs> I explained that, because uh, you had to have your hair really short, and you could almost tell I was like in the army or military. And he said, where are you coming from? And I told him, and he was like, you know, he was uh, appreciated the fact that I was a soldier and that I was trying to get home, but he said, you still have to listen. <laughs> but, he, but he was very kind and didn't give me a, a ticket, so I had to crawl home like a turtle. Um, and then my son cried when he saw me, because I think it was the hair. Uh, but he got better after a while. How old was he when he got back? What's that? How old was he when he got back? Oh, just, just one month older. He was like seven months old oh. then. Yeah, it was just one month that I went to uh, uh, Italy. But he still is like acted like he didn't know me because of my haircut. <laughs> um, so I made him do push up. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, when you figured out you were going to leave Italy, mm -hmm. how did you find out? Um, what, when my time was up, that I was actually going to go back home. Yes. Um, the uh, my platoon sergeant. You still have that ranking. Uh, the, our sergeant that was in charge of us, he told us that uh, the 452nd General Hospital will now be uh, leaving because I, I think another group from another place was going to take that over. And the um, active duty soldier guys were still in Kuwait, so that was hard on them. And uh, like I said, when in the military, it's all a team. Everybody does this, so this person can do this, and this person can do that, and help each other. What was your last day like? Um, my last day was, um, I was glad to do two things. I was glad to be there to help out our country, because I'm all, you know, I'm, when you're a soldier, you're always like, USA, number one. <laughs> you know, you're very proud to be an American and very thankful. And you do whatever you can, for the most part. Uh, but I was very excited to, uh, to go back. At that time, we lived in Wisconsin, so I was very glad to get back to Wisconsin and, and see everybody. What was it like on the day you got home? Well, like I said, I was a little too eager to get back. Uh, so.